for this particular episode, I kind of find myself in a quandary because I pastor St. Patrick Lutheran Church. Obviously, I'm going to cover St. Patrick. The problem, though, is that there's not a whole lot to know about St. Patrick. We're going to get into St. Patrick's story and some of the writings that he wrote, but we don't have a lot from St. Patrick. St. Patrick has three writings that survive from his time, one of which is an excommunication letter to uh, someone within Ireland that was uh, pillaging, and he was someone of royal, royal blood. And he basically said, look, if you don't give these Christians back their property that you stole, you will be excommunicated from the church and damned to hell. Like, you know, St. Patrick was pretty, pretty strict on that. But the two documents that we have of St. Patrick that are most well-known is his Confessions, which is basically his autobiography, which is very short. It's only maybe a 30-minute read at best. And then it's St. Patrick's Breastplate, his, uh, his prayer, his hymn of prayer and praise and strengthening that he wrote. St. Patrick, he is British. He grows up in Britain a Roman citizen, and he is captured at a very young age, you know, early teen years, and he spends six years as a slave in Ireland. So he's actually not Irish. A lot of people have that misconception that St. Patrick is Irish. But St. Patrick is not Irish. He's actually British, and he was captured by pagan Irishmen and taken to be a slave in Ireland. He stays there for six years until he has the opportunity to escape back to Britain to be back with his father and mother. Quick facts about St. Patrick's father. He was a deacon in the church, an ordained deacon at that, which tells us that not only does the early church ordain deacons into the office of the holy ministry, but also the idea of celebrate priests was not a thing because St. Patrick's grandfather was a priest. And I had a... Uh, papist apologist, I will not mention this papist apologist's name because, you know, I want to save him the embarrassment, but one of the things he brought up to me was his theory that um, the reason why Britain was having issues with Ireland, and, and St. Patrick talks about this in his confession, that there were sins of the people, and that was the reason why God is judging Britain and allowing the Irish to come and like, you know, take people away into slavery. And one of those sins, this papist apologist told me, was that the clergy were not celibate, that the clergy were marrying. But that's not what St. Patrick says in his confession. That's not what he says in his autobiography. He says that it was the people who would not listen to their priests and deacons that was causing judgment. So it had nothing to do with the priests and deacons marrying that was causing judgment. It was that the people would not listen to them when they preached the word of God, when they told them instruction from the word of God. And when he comes home, he has the strong urge to go to his bishop, go into, he didn't call it seminary, but what we would see as seminary, you know, a phase of learning, a time of learning so that he may be ordained and go back and be a missionary to the Irish people who had enslaved him. And instead of St. Patrick saying, you know, I've got this vision from God to go and start churches in Ireland. No, he, he goes to his bishop. He goes to his bishop, and then he goes through the process of learning. And then he also goes through uh, some really intense examination, and one of which examination that is unfair to him, where somebody divulged his confession from his youth. I can relate. And they use that to accuse him, to say that he wasn't worthy of the ministry, because back in the day, when he was a kid, he said he didn't really believe, even though he was very open about him coming to faith at a later age in his, in his teen years. The Lord saw him through it. The Lord saw him through it. And not only did they did his bishop allow him to go to Ireland and to preach the gospel, but they ordained him a bishop. That was not his intention. St. Patrick is very clear in the confession that in the in his confessions that he was not looking to become a bishop. That was not his goal. 
and in fact he he felt uh very very unworthy of of such a title but if that's god's will he was going to accept it and so he goes as bishop and apostle to ireland to convert the people to preach the gospel the invocation of the true god the the three in one one in three uh, he was big in preaching the trinity he is well known for his triune fervency in fact in the confessions you don't even get to the third paragraph before he gives a summation of the apostles creed the nicene creed and the athanasian creed all of them together like he basically takes all of the parts of the trinity from from those those things and he puts it all together in a very concise way like it basically in his own words and he hits every single point explaining the trinity you don't even get get three paragraphs into his autobiography and he's already taking you know parts of the apostles nicene and athanasian creeds and basically using that to explain the trinity which goes against a lot of the myths surrounding saint patrick that he used the three leaf clover then the three leaf clover is associated with St. Patrick. It's a part of his symbol, you know, but he never used that. He never used the three leaf clover. But it's okay. It's okay if we have him painted with a three leaf clover. It's not gonna not gonna deter anything of what he says and what he taught. Because he he really emphasized the Trinity. And I, I have a sinking suspicion, as do many other uh, scholars that are much more smarter than me. The reason why he emphasized the Trinity so much is because he's going to pagan lands and he has to distinguish the true God of Scripture from the pagan gods, which were, you know, active in in that area. We might as well say demons, you know, these demons that are active in this land, which is another thing we come to the the idea that uh, St. Patrick drove out the snakes from Ireland. And a lot of people have looked at this legend and said, well, what this actually is supposed to represent is an allegory of St. Patrick driving the Druids, these, these snakes, these people that were conjuring demons and worshiping pagan gods. He's driving them out by the preaching of the gospel. And so it, that's also okay. I'm okay with, you know, St. Patrick, um, you know, driving snakes out, like as far as like the, the paintings of him, you know, driving out the snakes, because that's a representation, an artistic representation of him preaching the gospel and driving out the enemy, driving out the pagan gods and the druids and all that stuff. And he did it without force. He did it solely by preaching God's word. Now, I've had a few comments in the past on my videos on YouTube and also on this podcast because I tend to introduce myself as Pastor Brandon War, pastor of St. Patrick Lutheran Church in Chipley, Florida. And I'll get mockers and scoffers, mostly of the papist variety that say things like, who, who, der, is St. Patrick a Lutheran? Why would you have a church, a Lutheran church named St. Patrick? There is nothing in St. Patrick's doctrine that Luther would disagree with, that Lutherans would disagree with, that the Book of Concord would disagree with. And so he's our saint. He belongs to the Catholic true Catholic church, the ones who continue to preach the same gospel and doctrine that St. Patrick preached. I don't see how you can read St. Patrick's confessions and not think that he's Lutheran. And that comment from St. Patrick in his confessions about, you know, not relying on the works of his own righteousness and allowing, you know, God's work, allowing Christ's righteousness to be the thing that keeps him in Ireland to preach— it reminds me of when Luther said, you know, yeah, while, while I drank Wittenberg beer, the word of God went out and did what the word of God promised to do. His word doesn't come back void. In other words, Luther is saying that it wasn't his expertise, it wasn't his righteousness, it wasn't his abilities that allowed the preaching and the doctrines of the Reformation to go forth. It was because the word of God agreed with it. The word of God was the thing that went out. And it transformed people, and it made people see Christ, truly see Christ. 
regardless of anybody wants to acknowledge it or not, St. Patrick, that is his legacy. His legacy is that he preached Christ crucified, and that's what he would want. He doesn't want to be remembered as anything more than a humble country boy, the son of a deacon, the grandson of a priest, who got the opportunity to preach Christ and him crucified to people that he had no business. Like he, he had no business as someone from Britain to show any sort of love or sympathy to the pagan Irish people. And yet, that was his goal, was to preach Christ to them so that they may know Christ 